we'll 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 start on time. Um, yes. Um, I guess there's a a, a little bit is uh, for those who don't know me. My name's Ian Raspin. Most people know me as Rasbo. Um, so I've I've sort of come come to set this uh, this uh, day's presentation in motion. Um, I've been involved with the program as an athlete and now as a as a coach. Um, and I've had uh, a bit to do with Ryan Wesley, who uh, I've introduced David. David is Ryan Wesley's father. Um, I'm not sure whether uh, you guys are familiar with David, but you know he's been around the scene for a long time, uh, up and down the riverbanks, as you would expect from any parent who's supporting their child. Um, so David has, has come to speak to us today and to, to share you know his journey a little bit with. Um, with Ryan and what's gone on for him and his family, um, and the opportunity for uh, for you guys to, to ask questions and, and, and talk through, um, you know, maybe your journeys a little bit, and, and I guess possibly share any pearls of wisdom that that, that David might have. Um, we are trying to send this out online, so hello to those people who were <laughs> who were possibly listening online. I'm hoping the technology is working okay um, because I'm not over familiar with it. Um, I think the suggestion was, for those who have attended this before, um, is that we, we run the questions at the end. And for those people who are listening online, then potentially, um, I believe there is a text box that you can present a question in. And if I'm on my toes, we can pick that up and offer that to David at the end of the session. Um, if you are listening online, again, I would encourage you to turn off your, uh, your sound button so that um, if you do <laughs> get involved in other conversations outside of this, not everybody can hear, I believe that's the case. Um, <laughs> yeah, that would be slightly embarrassing, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah, so this is the second Elite Parent uh, presentation. I don't know how many attended the one with uh, Andy Hounds, Laura and Anne. Was there, was there, was there many came to oh, that no, one? Okay, so uh, yeah, I mean the, the the agenda is not too tight. Um, Dave's been given a little bit of guidance, but it can go as the, the floor feels it should. So feel free to, uh, to to ask questions, and if you feel as though you know there's something pressing at the time, I'm sure sure Dave will offer his his wisdom. I think he might drag me in on occasions to offer a little a little bit of my experience on if, uh, of this. Uh, well, my experience with working alongside the line. So over to you, David. Thank you very much, Rosebo. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much for taking the time out. I know it's um, busy when you're um, running around after the children, uh, trying to keep them warm, fed, and in the right place at the right time with the right kit. Um, but at least it is dry and warm in here. Uh, I'm down for about 40 minutes. Hopefully, uh, we'll cook a little bit shorter than that. Uh, as Rosebo says, uh, I'd like it to be what you want, though. Um, I have been given some topics. I'll bring those up if there's uh, nothing else. But equally, please jump straight in. I know Rosbo said questions at the end, but if there's a specific topic or <coughs> issue you want to discuss, um, then please feel free to, to jump straight in. Um, it's particularly useful having Rosbo here. Uh, uh, as he said, he's been involved with Ryan uh, over an extended period, um, took him pretty much from junior all the way to the senior team, uh, and uh, uh, had to deal with him during a particularly challenging period. Uh, as Ryan uh, transitioned to being an adult uh, and exploring some of the limits um, when he moved away from home and was at university. Uh, we'll come on to that in a bit more detail uh, and so uh, I'm hoping Ryan will be able to provide a bit more insight into um, how we, well, I won't say manage, but how we dealt with that uh, situation uh, and how things have worked out since. Um, I'm sure you all appreciate uh, I'm representing the whole of my family uh, in particular, my wife and my parents, who uh, have done as much, if not more, than me. Um, I've served in the military for the last 32 years, uh, and during Ryan's um, uh, uh, junior years, I spent a lot of time away, and they had to bear the brunt of supporting uh, 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 and assisting him. Um, on one particular occasion, um, I was away, had a bad day at the office, phoned my wife to find out how Ryan had got on. Uh, she was still on the top of our camper van in the pouring rain. Uh, Dale kind of strapped the news on having just nearly seen Ryan drown. As you can imagine, that was a fairly short phone call. Um, <laughs> my parents have run all over the world uh, following Ryan. Um, when he was a junior, he had the opportunity to go to a junior world championships in Foix, um, but it was the same day he was taking a GCSE examination. So my mother had to go and take him from school, take responsibility for his phones and laptop, 
taken to the airport in Bristol and while I dropped my dad with a canoe in Bournemouth and they finally met up about 12 hours later somewhere in France. Um, so uh, they very much have been involved and it is a family affair as I'm sure you're all finding out. Um, and Ryan would not have been able to achieve what he has to date without that support. One thing, one thing I neglected to say in the start was, um, I'm sure you guys are all up to speed, but uh, Ryan is currently our European champion and was silver medalist at the World Championships this year. So uh, I don't know whether that went on over anybody's head. I'm hoping it didn't, but maybe I should have brought that to your attention to start with. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, my, just my, my background, it says I've been in the military, but I did canoe um, in my teens, uh, very much an enthusiastic amateur. Mm -hmm. Um, it was about the same time that Rasbo was um, winning world championships and people like Richard Fox and the like were about. Um, but I do know a bit about canoeing, but as you can tell, not necessarily about being a full-time athlete. Um, <laughs> so I, that's pretty much where um, Ryan's story started. Um, let's see if this works. Is it on that? Yeah. I'm assuming that'll do the trick, will it? Oh, hey, don't we love, don't we love technology? <laughs> ah, brilliant. Yeah. Um, as a previous canoeist, um, having got married, had children, um, I got back into canoeing, um, and uh, starts. Um, no. Yeah. Um, at a time when it wasn't quite as uh, fashionable uh, and the equipment was a little bit more basic. Um, but uh, that was me racing um, at Salisbury in the um, early 90s. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Ryan used to come along and we introduced him fairly early to canoeing. Um, he started messing about three years old in um, various bits of kit that I had left over from when I was a teenager, surf skis, old slalom boats and the like. Um, it wasn't until uh, I guess he was about six or seven um, when we started introducing him to white water, um, purely recreationally. Uh, we lived in the southwest at that stage uh, and the slalom scene was, um, was very small in that area. Uh, there wasn't really much opportunity, it was just river running, um, surfing, that sort of thing. Um, as a result of my job, I moved to Yorkshire in uh, the mid noughties about 2004-2005, uh, to a place called Dishworth, which was very near, um, I don't know if you've heard of a place called Slenningford on the River Year near Ripon. Um, basically a campsite with a rapid next to it. Uh, while we were based there, we would regularly go and Ryan would spend hours messing about on the river. Um, while we were there, we found out that there was a local slalom being run there. Ryan entered, he did very well, and one of the local canoe clubs picked him up um, and started introducing him to slalom. Um, and uh, uh, Low Wolf was a club that he joined, a guy uh, called Phil Stevenson took him under his wing. And Ryan got involved with Yorkshire, uh, paddled uh, for them over a, a number of years, progressed from Division 4 up to uh, Premier. Um, and then in a, I think it was 2007, um, he was uh, selected to join the, uh, I think what was called the Olympic Development Programme back then, uh, as a 14 year old, uh, and that involved him um, coming pre predominantly to Nottingham at the weekends uh, to train uh, with people uh, under the stewardship, people like uh, Raspberry, Neil Buckley and the like. Uh, his compatriots were similar to those uh, that uh, at race now, Joe Clark, um, James Moore, um, uh, were uh, in and around at the same time. Um, Ryan then progressed uh, through junior uh, under 23 and then senior team in 2014 uh, and moved down here um, in 2014 to be full-time athlete and that's uh, where he is now. Uh, that's where it says uh, this last year has been his most successful to date. Uh, with European Championships, uh, bronze medal in one of the World Cups, silver at the World Championships, and every final that he raced and made uh, the lowest position to sit. So, um, unfortunately, he has uh, suffered a bit of an injury at the moment, um, so um, he's going through a rehabilitation at present. Uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, he'll be uh, back racing next year.
Uh, so that's his um, journey. I'm not a coach. Um, I was a training instructor a long, long time ago when I was 16. Um, so I did teach Ryan to canoe initially, uh, but it very quickly became apparent that I did not have the skills, and that's where I suppose team came in. So um, very much an amateur in that respect. So please take uh, any advice and information that I give you a bit pinch of salt. Uh, here we go. I have been given a number of topics, but please. If there are specific questions or other uh, areas that you want to explore, um, then uh, please feel free. Uh, first one, I think it is fairly, I don't know, I don't like to say fairly straightforward, and I think is similar to any parenting. I think we start off pretty much doing everything. We're the bank managers, the laundry cooks, taxi drivers, mm -hmm. repairers, clean fitters, um, uh, coaches, as best we can. Um, and as I said, for me, uh, for, for us, it was very much a, a family affair. Um, my wife and I, our two daughters, Megan and Lauren, um, they canoed as well initially, um, up to Division 2, uh, and certainly um, enjoyed the social aspects of being part of the canoeing family. Um, hopefully you've seen that going to races, uh, and we used to travel the length and breadth of the country, uh, meeting up with friends um, uh, to uh, take part in canoe races uh, and that's from our perspective I think the biggest part is it was a social um, um, and recreational um, uh, uh, sport uh, initially um, and I think it took Ryan quite a long time to progress from treating it as a bit of recreation to treating it more professionally um, and that, that is I think um, a challenge. I'm not sure how um, it's best managed. Uh, some of the things for Ryan, I think by just keeping it fun um, and uh, allowing him to take responsibility and ownership as he became an adult for his involvement, uh, I think that was probably the largest part of it. Uh, I think like most parenting though, as he got older, uh, we took more of a back, uh, back seat uh, and we're very much now um, supporting uh, and a bit of a call for emergency service when things go horribly wrong. Uh, he doesn't put weight in his canoe, um, or cars break down, um, uh, or he needs immediate assistance. But he's pretty much now um, independent. We go along and support wherever we can. Uh, at what age did it become more serious? Um, I think probably GB Canoeing and Ryan will have two different perspectives on that. <laughs> um, I think um, from the programs wise, it would have undoubtedly been about 2007 when he was picked up to join uh, a formal program. Um, for Ryan, it was probably about uh, 2012 when he moved down here uh, and became a full-time athlete. Uh, initially, um, I would say it was slightly complicated. Uh, family background, um, in 2007 I was based in Yorkshire, was moved to Hampshire and we ended up putting our children into school in Bristol. So um, I think that we'll come on to it a bit later, but the bottom line is at that period I think we should have been a bit more uh, involved with GB canoeing and discussing what was happening within the family um, because we didn't expect Ryan to get on the programme and that didn't perhaps feature in our decision making as much as perhaps in hindsight it should. Um, I don't know what your thoughts were at that time, Lesbo, if you can remember. Um, um, I, think, I think we were probably as involved as any other parents were at that stage. Stuff that isn't, so I don't know if the air conditioning is making all the noise, but um, yeah, I mean, you know, people take varying uh, amounts of interest, and uh, I would say that you were, you were as the norm, really. Um, yeah, I think you were you were there to talk to if we if, if there was something that was serious enough to, to have to pick the phone up to, to talk to you. So uh, Ryan was based in. Bristol. Um, most of the training was going on in Nottingham and uh, North Wales, uh, so we had a number of years where we would collect him on a Friday, drive to either Nottingham and uh, North Wales, he would then train all weekend and then we'd drive him back. Um, he didn't get as much um, contact, I think, with uh, the programme uh, as a lot of others that were perhaps closer to the uh, centres at Nottingham. Um, I don't know whether that's a good or a bad thing. I think from our perspective we saw it as a good thing because it allowed him to keep a life outside of canoeing. Uh, he got involved with all sorts of things at school and other sports. Um, 
uh, and I think maintained a, a good balance, we believe. Um, maybe it didn't allow him to progress as rapidly at junior level as perhaps he may have done elsewhere. But equally, whether or not he would have carried on, we'll just never know. But uh, that was his circumstance. Uh, next, please. Uh, and I think this links directly in. Um, we, fortunately or not, um, he was separated from canoeing the majority of his time. He was at school in Bristol. Canoeing was going on at Nottingham. It's something that he jumped in and out of, um, either at weekends or during holidays. Uh, or there you go. How did he view that at the time? Did, did he feel that was unfair, that he was a long way from it, or did he just accept that was sort of life? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to... I'm trying not going to try and give, do Ryan a disservice, but I think he saw it as great because he missed Saturday school uh, <laughs> to go to training. Um, he saw it as great because he went and saw friends. He went off and did something that he enjoyed. Uh, I had, a, I was hope, he was hopefully going to be here uh, so I could have got his insight into how he felt. I had a chat with him last night. He came home early um, because of his uh, injury. Um, uh, and we had a chat last night. And I think, yeah, for him, he was at school. He was having a whale of a time. He was enjoying going canoeing. <laughs> Pretty also the best words, but right? Yeah, I think so. I don't think he saw it as a, a negative. I think he just saw his invo what involvement he did have as a positive. And as I say, we perceive that actually uh, it gave him a reasonable balance, oh. uh, an opportunity to partake in other activities um, uh, that he may not have had um, if he'd been full time um, uh, up in uh, Nottingham. Do you think it allowed his focus to be more focused when he was kayaking then? <clears throat> if he'd have been doing it sort of five days a week, do you think he'd have been a bit more lackadaisical as opposed to being more focused? No, I think that's entirely fair. Um, and uh, yeah, definitely. On the whole, uh, I, uh, and, and we, we, you know, we, we, when we did go, we tried to get the absolute maximum out of it. Uh, it is a balance because obviously they're, they're young at that age. Um, they, uh, they don't have the endurance. Um, that they do uh, as they get older. So it's a balance. I don't know what your thoughts were on seeing Ryan on a, a weekend basis. Uh, yeah, I think at the time there was, uh, we used to run a, a, a bit of an academy program where uh, there was actually a package put together where athletes could transition to Nottingham. We put them in a homestay arrangement, so we introduced uh, them to a, a family to live with. They then attended a school uh, not too far from Home Pay Point. Um, and Adam Burgess, Tom Quinn, I think, um, George, George Tatchell, and one Tom Brady, I think, were all were all individuals who went through that. Um, so Ryan was sort of in that peer group, but um, I was looking after those guys at the time, or some of those guys. Um, I think what was hard for for me maybe is that you know, as always with athletes, is that you know you are you're presenting a program to him, encouraging him to engage with that program. But, you know, you can't really tell whether that's actually going on. I mean, you can on a physical basis a little bit because when it comes to doing sort of some sort of monitoring things, you can see whether people are progressing. But, you know, outside of that, it's it's more difficult to, to actually see how much engagement there is. Um, whereas, you know, for those athletes who were based in Nottingham, um, you know, you, you're seeing them on a daily basis and... Uh, you can you can see you know who is engaged, who are front of the bus athletes, if we use you know today's technology, uh, today's terminology, um, and I think that's always the challenge for people who are remote from from the uh, the centres is you know are they engaged as much as we would like them to be, um, with, with without recognising the challenges that you know they don't get the regular exposure to the white water and all the things that they potentially would like to do even when they are engaged. Uh, I think that's fair enough. Um, impact on family, obviously, yes. I mean, you know, any elite um, uh, athlete it's, uh, and, and sport commitment is going to involve the whole family. Um, how do we manage it? Um, principally by all being involved. Um, and again, I think it's just something that we grew up with. Um, we would go camping, with, uh, the, the whole family would be involved in the sports and activities that we took part in, and that sort of transitioned into canoe slalom, say my daughters did paddle, they then took greater advantage of the social aspects, um, but they also um, helped out with, with volunteer and support events, um, both nationally and internationally, 
um, to, uh, to A, be involved, um, but also to help out. So I think that's probably how we um, uh, best uh, uh, managed. But it, it does have an impact. Um, uh, we do have a daughter that's a particular challenge uh, and consumes quite a lot of our time and effort, uh, as done over the last few years. Uh, and we never know whether some of those issues are as a result of Ryan's involvement and our commitment to that. Um, Um, what sort of behaviours? <laughs> uh, obviously, I spent an awful lot of time in the car with Ryan, um, and I think it goes back to many of the other points. Because we weren't a hundred percent immersed in the canoeing psyche, he, he he very much saw it as an opportunity, uh, as something different, uh, as um, something that he enjoyed doing. Uh, so approached it from that perspective. Uh, I think um, he perhaps didn't um, fully appreciate what was expected of a professional athlete uh, and a rounded athlete. So you know when you talk about uh, um, you know, weight training or diet um, or lifestyle, then those sort of things um, certainly when he was going through his teenage years were going way above his head. Um, as long as he could canoe, uh, then that was fine some of the other bits he didn't fully appreciate. Um, and maybe he still doesn't. Uh, but, um, you know, I think that, that's just the nature of him. And I think one of the big lessons is every child is different. Uh, you can't write a rule book for this. Uh, they will all need managing individually, uh, and assisting individually, and they will all transition through the sport differently. Um, it seems to have worked for Ryan. at this stage whether or not there are things that we should have done differently and whether they would have actually made any difference. But I think um, Ryan was very much um, enjoying the activity uh, rather than perhaps focusing, uh, I think, have you got anything else on that? Um, yeah, I mean Ryan, uh, as if you've watched him on the water, you recognise he's a very talented technical athlete and I think for Ryan anyone who worked with him or saw, or saw him train and compete would realize the same things. I think that, as David was alluding to, maybe some of those next level type of things um, arguably got lost a bit for Ryan because he could hide behind his technical competence um, and why there were other athletes that, that maybe were more advanced, both in their level of engagement and maturity, if that's the right word, um, you know, whenever whenever the the watch was was put on and it was time to, to to demonstrate what you were capable of, Ryan always migrated to the top because he was technically very good. Um, and I think, you know, that that to a large degree probably kept him engaged in 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 the sport um, because you know, although I'd like to think the messages that were coming from me and other coaches were you know, those that were encouraging him to, to, to try and make sure that he was doing all the things and, and, and carrying on a lifestyle that was appropriate for somebody who was going to aspire to being an Olympic champion. Um, then, you know, uh, maybe maybe with without his technical competence and, and when it did come to measuring success, which, you know, is very easy to do off a results sheet, you know, um, he, he generally saw himself in a good place, and that I think that did keep him involved, even though there was quite a lot going on in the background sometimes. At what age was he? This is, did he decide to specialise C1? And do you think it was about the appropriate time, or could he have carried on longer doing C and K1? Um, I did C1, um, and <laughs> he messed about in my old boats from a very young age. Uh, when we introduced him to slalom, when he did his first slalom, he did both K1 and C1. Uh, and that's what he did for the first, I'd say, year to 18 months. But to be quite frank, C1 was the only one that he was really interested in. Whether it was, uh, I imagine at the early stages it was because I did it, but I think he found it, uh, as, as Rasbo says, he's a technician, uh, and I think he found that most challenging, and therefore the one that he wanted to, uh, to get involved in. Uh, he also did C2. Uh, for a number of years, uh, was uh, still on the list at under 23, 
uh, with Zach Franklin. I think most of you should know him because he coaches now. Um, and uh, that was particularly good. I, I, I think paddling in different types helps, um, uh, both as they're growing up uh, and um, even you know, at, at senior level, Ryan still goes and jumps in the K1 on occasion, and I know other athletes do. So I think at the early stages, as much exposure as, as you can get. Um, Ryan, uh, C2 was the first um, class he got selected to, uh, to join the junior team in, in 2009. Uh, and that gave him an opportunity to start experiencing international racing and what it's, part, uh, what it's about to be part of uh, the GB team. Um, so Ryan, I think, was always going to end up in C1, um, but uh, we've tried to encourage him to take uh, part in it, or to, 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 to paddle uh, different classes <coughs> as much as possible. There's, it's difficult to know when it's going to make it. You know, obviously, there's a point you've got to focus. Yeah. I just wonder whether, as well, that's uh, a point you could allude on. Is there an age at which you said something sort of kids should make sort of pin the colours to the mask? At what point is it a case of when they're in a division, or is it when they're reaching a certain age? Or um. Yeah, without without going off too much on a tangent here. Yeah. Um, I don't think there is a consensus within the program from the coaches. I think what we, we, we do see a little bit is that um, those athletes who still see themselves as competitors in both classes tend to stay engaged in that. Um, but I would suggest that certainly, you know, that transition tends to happen at sort of end age range, so between 16 and 18, roughly speaking. Um, and I think at that stage, you know, athletes start to see that they may be stronger in one boat than they are in the other. And inevitably, like all of us, you know, when we see success, we tend to migrate towards that activity because we think we're good at it. And that bolsters our confidence. Um, so I think, you know, that it, it generally happens like that. Um, and, um, yeah, for, for, for the guys that I'm working with, then... We have guys who have started off at the start of the ENTS program in both classes, and now they're, they're starting to specialise a bit. There's one or two who are trying to still juggle both boats. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure if there is a right and wrong answer in terms of, you know, can it go all the way? Well, we've seen a few people, Fabien Lefebvre, the French Olympic champion and uh, world champion in kayak and C1, you know, managed to do it. So it is possible. Um, but you know whether it is for everybody, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I answered your question. <laughs> yeah, I think it's got to start on which one they prefer, because it's it's about enjoyment, and that will breed motivation, um, and that will breed success. Um, so it's got to be what they prefer. Um, then, as as we said, results will obviously drive probably uh, alongside that. You know, which one they they focus on, uh, and that will probably help with the enjoyment aspect. So. It, I think there's another thing in here, and that is it's not that long ago that you couldn't have had them more than one class. That's right. Yeah. International. Yeah. And that's, um, that's started the C1 women, didn't it? I think prior to C1 women being a category internationally, I think yeah. you couldn't have them more than one class. I think it was 2006, wasn't it? That was the first year, I think. You're ahead of me. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah. 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 Uh, right, was there any more questions or points? Um, were we aware of Ryan's goals? Uh, I, absolutely. Um, I, I don't, having not been involved in elite sport, I don't think we were perhaps as um, focused as far ahead as perhaps um, the program is and how far they're looking um, to the future. Uh, we were looking more short term, did one. Prem, <coughs> team, um, that sort of thing, rather than this is going to be you know, our next representative at the Olympics in whatever. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I think we were far more focused on short-term goals uh, and maybe not uh, as attuned to the long-term. Um, hopefully we've uh, adjusted that, but I think when you're managing a family um, and a teenager, then it tends to be fairly short-term. Um, your yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Have you hung up your kit? Have you entered the race? And so on. Uh, did Ryan ever want to quit and how did we uh, manage that? Um, 
you may or may not know, um, Ryan, um, when he moved away from home and established himself at Nottingham, um, explored all of the limits uh, of an adolescent um, who was at university, uh, and I think probably tried our and GB canoeing for patients um, to the maximum, and that culminated with him being suspended from the program. Uh, and him ultimately, from our perspective, and this is where I am going to ask Raspberry to jump in, from a parent's perspective, it resulted in a, 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 an ultimatum. Um, in essence, it's up to you, your choice, but either you take it seriously um, or you focus elsewhere uh, and our support um, will adjust accordingly. Um, fortunately, he did turn himself around um, and decided that he did want to take it seriously uh, and uh, he, he, he got himself back on the team, got himself sorted and progressed. And I think for us, that was probably the high point or the most rewarding um, element uh, of the, the, the whole process because he took responsibility and ownership uh, and decided what it is he wanted to do um, rather than uh, as you probably feel up, you know when your children are younger you're there supporting um, you're hoping that it's what they want to do they may tell you it's what they want to do but you're never 100% sure uh, and I think at that point we felt that he had uh, decided uh, uh, and was behaving uh, uh, taking it more seriously uh, uh, and adopting a lot more principles. Uh, now, um, obviously, Ryan was at Nottingham. Um, we were living at this stage down in Hampshire. Um, so our communicate, you know, we only saw what Ryan wanted us to see uh, or hear. Um, uh, we would get snippets of other activity, um, but I think probably Resbo was uh, on the front line, as it were, during that period. Uh, and I know Resbo and uh, Neil Buckley in particular uh, had a lot to do to steering him back on to the straight and narrow, but it was a long process. I'd say it was probably about 18 months in total um, from when he first moved up until um, it was decision time. Yeah. yeah, so so I guess like all all youngsters and adolescents came to came to Nottingham, the big smoke, you know, a lot of distractions and exciting things to do. And uh, Ryan, like most young lads who've got an ego. Wanted to be out there and trying it, and uh, yeah, there was uh, with him uh, started at university. Um, you know, there were lots of other young lads who were keen to explore the nightlife and all that goes with it. And uh, yeah, so Ryan sort of during the day was presenting the image of being an athlete and aspiring to be a champion. Yet, you know, as as, as sort of seven eight o'clock at night ticked on, you know, he would. He would down his paddle and put on his dancing pants or whatever it is, um, and off he'd go. And then next morning, you know, I, I, to, to put it to him, he kept it. He kept it under wraps for quite a while. But uh, I was detecting that there was stuff going on that, that maybe wasn't what we would say is conducive to his development as an athlete. Um, we had various discussions and things, um, but you know, as I said, he kept it under wraps quite well. Um, but then on one particular occasion, he turned up with a limping, and uh, I think in the end it was uh, identified as he'd broken his foot, and I asked him how he'd done it, and he told me he was out running. Um, <laughs> but then, as it always happens, you know, the tails come out, and he wasn't running at all. I'm not sure where he was running from or to, uh, but there was definitely alcohol involved. Um, and that brought it to a head, really, and uh, I guess the combination of of, of um, an ongoing bit of an issue with that, with um, Ryan in terms of maybe not being fully engaged in the program um, and then blatantly lying to me, uh, I took it to the next level and it resulted, as David said, in a suspension and he was he wasn't removed from the program, he was suspended from the program for a six month period um, and uh, the ultimatum that we gave him was that, you know, he needed to demonstrate to us that he wanted to be part of the program and he wanted to be in line with the vision of the program. Um, and uh, yeah, over that period, helped very much, I believe, by Zach Franklin, who he was close friends with at the time. And I think Zach, you know, again, enjoyed a bit of the nightlife, but was also keen to try and climb the, the, the performance ladder. Um, they they created a little alliance and worked and worked quite effectively, I believe, sort of towards the back end of that period. Um, and I guess that that demonstrated to us that Ryan, you know, was serious about what he wanted to do. 
you know, it, it was a difficult situation for us because, you know, rarely do we get individuals walk through the door who are technically competent as Ryan was and talented. Um, but there he was flying in the face of what we used to call the core values or the front of the bus behaviours, if we want to use a bit more modern modern speak. Um, so it was a tough one for British canoeing because, you know, we don't we don't get these people who are, who are really gifted uh, in a boat that frequently. And it, it was hard. But thankfully, Ryan sort of pulled himself in line um, and came back into play. Um, I reestablished a, a relationship with him. Um, he did say that it was probably the best thing that I ever did for him because it, it, it put into focus very quickly, you know, whether he he wanted it or he didn't want it. And I, through through his own means, he came to the conclusion that he did want to be part of it. And as you know from the results today, he hasn't really looked back on that. And I think, you know, he recognised that, yeah, it's, it's great fun going out and partying. But, you know, in the long term, it's much better to travel around the world racing, you know, at the highest level and, and all the... Uh, bits that come with that. Mm. No, I, it's difficult, every child will be different. Um, I think uh, uh, the way in which it was handled in the end worked um, and was the only ultimate solution. Um, he had to decide what he wanted, he wanted uh, and it, that came to a, 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 an ultimate but it, it, it's worked out. I think we've got the question. So. Brilliant. I mean, I remember at the time, I think his peers weren't convinced necessarily that he was going all through that. No, no, I think you're right. Um, it, it was a very um, a difficult time. I think uh, he had been, perhaps this was the downside of him being at school in Bristol. Uh, he was in a very controlled environment. He was a boarding school and monitored all the time. They don't get the freedoms that perhaps um, uh, other children do. Uh, so uh, he, when he was given that opportunity, it was like a uh, child in a candy shop, uh, and I think, uh, in hindsight, um, well, I don't know. I don't know how else we could have managed it. Um, he needed to move to Nottingham. That was the only uh, logical step. Um, I'm not sure how we could have best managed it. And, and university didn't work out for him. He started one course, stopped that, uh, did a full year, and that's uh, on another course, and that was probably where. Uh, he was enjoying the other aspects of university life a bit too much um, and started his second year after he'd um, got himself sorted uh, and ended up realising that they just weren't compatible. Uh, there were too many distractions and uh, he decided to give up uh, university again for the second time to enable him to remain focused on him. Uh, that worked for him. Um, you know, obviously, as parents, you want your child to develop, uh, you know, go to... <laughs> Education, especially, I think something that you're never certain how um, something like an elite sport is going to work out. Uh, I think both my parents are teachers, so you've always got this thing in the back of your mind. Well, no, you should be getting an education. You should be getting an education. Um, I think now we're fortunately in a position where you know, Ryan has got an education. It's not necessarily a university one, but uh, he's been given opportunities that uh, I think uh, he's benefited from, uh, and that he wouldn't have got elsewhere. Great. Um, did I get involved? I've been involved in canoeing since I was a child. Um, so yes, we got involved. It started off by taking him. Uh, it started, uh, progressed on to then paddling with um, other children and support, uh, acting as a, you know, helping as a coach and fishing kids out of the water. Um, uh, I got back into slalom, got up to Div 1, and then Ryan rapidly overtook me. And, uh, <laughs> I uh, res returned to the bank. Um, and. Uh, we got involved uh, helping uh, the, the coaches or uh, helping run uh, events um, when, when it's been uh, possible. There is a thriving veterans class. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do still canoe, but I live in. Sorry, thank you very much. Um, I, I, <laughs> I do um, still canoe, but purely white water now, recreational. Uh, I live down in Somerset, um, travelling to Slums. Is, uh, You've done enough of that. Yes. <laughs> as much as we enjoy coming and watching races, um, uh, we try and get to as many that we can uh, when they're, they're close enough. Right. Um, this was a very difficult one when we were considering it. Um, obviously, it, it defines him at the moment. Uh, I don't think we'll be able to answer that for another 10 years. 
Um, he's at a crucial point, I think, probably uh, you know, with the Olympic selection next year. Uh, and I think that um, and Tokyo will probably be the defining moment. We'll have to wait and see how it um, comes up. Um, take home messages. I think, um, first of all, you've got to keep it fun. Uh, I think that's worked for Ryan on the whole. Um, yes, they may not follow the route that you necessarily perceive as best, uh, but as long as it's fun, as long as they're enjoying it, um, then I think uh, hopefully it will work and you've got to support that. Uh, we immersed ourselves in the sport. Uh, we've got lifelong friends that um, we uh, you know, keep up with, um, uh, and uh, it's been uh, for our family a huge reward. My parents still follow Ryan around the world. They were, my mum was in Rio, running down the bank uh, on his other silver medal. So um, you know, we, uh, and, and we try and, 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 and we make the gold as much as we can. Uh, would we have done anything differently? <laughs> it's um, personal circumstance. As somebody that's serving in the military, um, I got dictated to uh, as to where I would live and what I would do. Um, now, some of that helped. Uh, Ryan would never have got involved in Slalom, I don't think, if I hadn't been posted to Yorkshire uh, and he hadn't um, gone to Slalom, but had been picked up by the local club. There's no way he would be involved in Slalom now if that hadn't happened. Um, however, it was not full of pressure on us as a family. I spent a lot of time away uh, and we had to move at times where, you know, when he could have done with um, a little bit of um, uh, consolidation uh, and stability um, in, in clearing his education. Um, so, um, the things I would have liked to have done differently, I don't think I would have had or been able to. So, um, it seems to have worked. As I say, I think the, the final, we're not going to make a certain to take it. That, that's one, I don't know how many. That, that should be it. Yeah. That is it. Um, if you want to go into the next one. Oh, was in so, the yeah, there's, sorry, there's one more slide. The, my crap. Oh, here, we go. <laughs> here we go. Here we go. Let's see if we can. Not quite sure. What is it? Oh, it's all right. Um, thank you very much for your patience and. Um, Attendance. Uh, I wish you all the very best and your children every success. Um, for us, it's been a fantastic journey. Uh, it's not ended yet, fingers crossed. Um, and uh, I find Kaluri, both domestically and internationally, a fantastic sport. Uh, it's a very much a family atmosphere uh, and uh, we've enjoyed every minute. Uh, Ryan wouldn't be where he is without people like Rasbo and his um, fellow competitors. So uh, we owe as much to them. Uh, does anybody have any questions? So I think what's interesting is when you said he didn't have access uh, to the squads and his much, you know, living really away. I think at the moment there's quite a lot of criticism where people lay on people. I think there's almost a um, sort of, I don't know, yeah. People who have all this access have got a greater opportunity and they've somehow got to step up on everybody. Uh, but Ryan has almost disproved that theory from doing what he's done and what he's achieved now. It's a difficult one. I'd say it worked for Ryan, um, and this is purely my personal opinion. I don't, I don't, I don't, I will take Rasbo's. Um, I think you can have too much access. Uh, and that may breed a, uh, a rate of progression that is not repre representative of that individual's long-term prospects, if that's their way of putting it. Uh, so I think if you do have the opportunity to take part in different activities and not necessarily be canoeing 100% of the time or accessing um, the, you know, Lee Valley 100% of the time, then that will um, hopefully build a rounder, more developed, uh, athlete uh, and also give a fairer indication of that individual's performance. Um, as Rasbo has said, uh, Ryan's ability to perform internationally outstripped his ability to perform at selection races um, on places like Nottingham in particular, where he just did not get as much access to that water as ours. But he was then able to deliver um, internationally, um, which I think 
is ultimately what we're, we're striving for. So um, we want it to be blunt, just because you're compatible with that, it doesn't necessarily translate into uh, international performance. Although, obviously with a facility like this, it has a significant benefit. Does that make sense? Raspberry, what are your thoughts? Um, <laughs> at the risk of uh, stirring up a, a tin of worms here. Uh, yeah, you know, the program and the coaches that work within it are sensitive to the fact that not everybody is based at a, at a main centre. Um, unfortunately, we only have a finite amount of resource. Um, and, you know, in, in order for us to continue to get that resource from UK Sport, we need to deliver at the Olympic at the Olympic level. That is the bottom line. We need to come away with medals. Um, and we have tried various models. You know, I talked about the academy earlier, and we've done we've done other things in the past where coaches have dissipated out to clubs and things like that. Um, there are, I think, I would believe through the actions that have been taken now that we believe that the most effective approach is to invest locally around those centers. Um, we have a, a, you know, a resource of, of young kids who potentially could become stars of the future. We recognize that there are other individuals out there who are not based locally, and we sympathize with that. But in terms of you know, trying to, with the limited finances we have, trying to invest appropriately to get the best out of it, then certainly the current model is trying to localize people at high performance centers. Hence, you know, why Nottingham and Lee Valley focus so highly um, in, in, in program activities. But I, I hope I've not stirred up too many, <laughs> too many worms there. Absolutely, absolutely, Mark. And I, I think, I think, you know, I would, you know, when you understand the story uh, behind Ryan, then you recognise that he, he, did, he did have his failings. <laughs> but uh, as you highlight, you know, I think it is worth showing athletes who possibly present. Well, I'm never going to be a champion because I don't live in Nottingham. Or I don't live in Lee Valley. You how know, many champions the, have come from the, Nottingham? And how many champions have come from Lee Valley? Well, yeah, absolutely. You know, there are there there a, 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 a spread a spread of, uh, of across the country. And, and I think, you know, we're not suggesting that, you know, you have to start there. But what is obvious is that when you reach the stage that uh, David's been talking about with the transition, it certainly makes it a lot easier for the family if you're already based there. You don't have to uproot and move across. You know, we, some of you might be aware of the Setchels, you know, they, they lifted house, moved jobs, moved into Nottingham to support Nikita's uh, aspirations in a canoe and that is a big big commitment um, and I guess that you know at some stages you know you might feel as though you, you need to address that issue or not and is it is it is it that important you know yeah. it is a toughie it's a toughie but as, as Dave said and and, and uh, Ryan's demonstrated you don't you don't necessarily have to be based at the center if you have lots of the other qualities that, that eventually will Bring you to the fore. I think, I think to be fair, though, I mean, that, that perception of you have to be placed at the centre that can be off putting because that's the sort of that's the perception that there's some club level. But from our experience, certainly at a more junior age group, mm -hmm. that's not strictly true. And actually, we've been pleasantly surprised how much British communities reached out to the clubs. Um, Absolutely. And as long as parents are prepared to travel, which we, which we are, yeah. it's actually been good. So I think. There's a danger in that perception going out there because that's not been our experience. You know, well, that's good to good to hear, and I think you'd be even more pleased to hear that you know one one of the main objectives of British canoeing um, in this cycle and and moving forwards, driven very hardly by David Joy, our new chief exec, is um, getting BCU uh, BCU British canoeing to uh, to engage more closely now with clubs and you know what what we appreciate and i'm sure you guys do as well is that you know um the 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 fund that we draw from is becoming more and more difficult to get hold of you know all this all the sports are, are competing for those limited amounts and we're realizing that you know if we had 
a stronger club system that you know could 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 engage um, with the programs at the early stage, then maybe that could do some of the work that is currently being done uh, by by British Canoeing. And so there's a real strong on it, and David Joy is really passionate about ensuring that we have a much stronger relationship with with the clubs around the country. Um, and as anyone who who has two brain cells to rub together will realise that the future of slalom in Britain, you know, there will be no events run, or maybe one or two, and that does happen in some of the other countries, you know, if there isn't a club system to support them. I think it ties in with the point about the very bad balance as well. Certainly at the beginning of the Pokemon Junior age group, but actually being away from the centres means we do deal with the stuff, and, and for us that's been healthy. Well, I have to say it worked for Ryan, uh, uh, and we, you know, there were points we the transition from the, the academy that um uh, raspberry was talking about that um stopped the right the year ryan became eligible uh, and there was a bit of a um, reorganization period where we didn't quite know what was going to happen plus what was going on um in, in my job at the time is what precipitated our move uh, and him going to to bristol uh, and then suddenly finally he's now on a program where we could have looked at other options um i think it's worked out for him. It suited Ryan. Uh, I, I think, as we well said, it shouldn't preclude people from achieving um, simply because they're not uh, in the immediate vicinity of Blue Valley and Nottingham. Um, there will become a point, though, when you're going to have to um, to move. And, and there's, uh, there's no doubt that this facility has precipitated, uh, you know, some fantastic results um, from GB canoeing across all the slalom. Uh, you know, then you have to look, but now you know we regularly winning individual medals, we're regularly putting two or three people into finals, whereas 10 years ago, um, there were one or two um, individuals that were delivering that, but not to the extent that it is now, and I think that's part of the programme, and it's part of facilities. Great. So one, one of the elephants, well, perhaps the elephants in the room is that um, not all of the athletes, or certainly these guys are parents too, Will, will have success, or what they define as success. And I think as parents, it's very important that what we're, we're here really to do is to make sure that these kids come out of it as fully rounded adults who can move on. And um, one of the experiences that I had as a, as a parent was perhaps when Joss was struggling a bit on the programme towards the end, and she was feeling a lot of pressure and probably for her last selection race we tried to put a lot in place that um, meant that not being selected was less of a less of a failure but more a, de a decision maker so if i get selected these are the things that happen if i don't get selected these are the things that happen rather than just continuing on as if this is all that's there's only one possibility, and then you fall off the edge of a cliff, and it's all terrible. Which you kind of a bit perhaps happened the previous year. So um, I think I think it's very difficult sitting on the start line when you're thinking, if I don't achieve this, then it's the end of the world. In fact, if if this run that I'm about to do is not a success, then it's the end of the world. And I think if you can try and put things in place so that um, it isn't the end of the world, it's just like you know. I know, I know what's going to happen either way, um, then that makes it easier. I think, Dave, you know, you're very right, you know, those, those sort of things have definitely influenced the way an athlete looks at things on the start line, and we as a program recognise that. And, you know, if you think it's life and death, it doesn't matter whether you're sat on the start line of a canoeing race or whatever it is, if it's life and death, you know, you're not going to you're not going to perform in that relaxed and, and, and best manner for you. And, and the programme recognises that. And the programme now, as is happening across all the UK-funded programmes, there is a much uh, greater awareness of the uh, holistic development of the athlete. Um, and now in place, we have a, an athlete welfare officer who part of her remit is to ensure that, you know, we are covering those bases and we're not being tarred with the same brush that potentially uh, academy, soccer academies maybe were a few years ago where, you know, everything would be about football. If you didn't make the cut, you were cut 
and just just tossed aside. Um, so there is a, a great awareness of that, and you might be uh, some of you might be aware of Emma Groom. Emma Groom is our lifestyle EIS lifestyle manager. So EIS, and we're talking to, to 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 people who know what EIS. English Institute of Sport is basically a service provider for elite sports. So they have psychologists, physiologists, doctors, biomechanics, performance analysts. Um, lifestyle managers, um, these are all services that programs can buy into to help look after their athletes. Um, and lifestyle management is a mandatory service that all um, Olympic funded programs have to take on board. So that's how high up the pecking order it's now seen. They have to do it. They have to pay for it. Um, and Emma Groom worked closely um, with uh, athletes and parents throughout the program. Admittedly, it, it's more towards those athletes that are looking at big transitions, so finishing the end of their secondary school and moving away from home potentially. Um, and she gets involved with that, and she is, you know, trying to, I guess, do what Dave was saying. You know, make them realise that it's not the be all and the end all. Yes, this program is about us getting Olympic medals, um, but it's about putting a package in place that means that an athlete, if things don't go well in a canoe, they have other things to fall back on. So, you know, I'd like to reassure you that that is, you know, up our agenda. We are not, I'd like, I hope we're not seen as, uh, like, the football academy is potentially. Kind of what you have in school. Mm -hmm. On a smaller, lower level, mm -hmm. we have school life and you have canoeing life. And they're two separate entities that would start and finish, you know, <coughs> Friday school finish. When did it start again? And the weekend or something different. And it's it's just smaller scales. It it is. I think I yeah, think the kids that say, "Oh, it's no good. Us, you know, we've not much point in us bothering. We don't live in Nottingham. Yeah. Or we don't live down in the valley." No, it does. That isn't their act. They shouldn't have that attitude because, as Ryan's shown, you don't have to live in the centre. And 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 at the sort of you know formative years, you know, we're we're, we're trying hard to ensure that. You know, canoeing and uh, and academia can can dovetail in together, so that you know there is progress made. And it's only it's only at the stage where athletes are choosing, you know, do I want to go on and do higher education, or do I want to become a full time athlete? And you know, when we get to those stages, then you know, athletes are sat down and and, and given the opportunity to talk through it with people who understand the territory and realise the you know the potential. Um, Consequences, maybe I don't know if that's the right word of of of, of making those sort of decisions. So you know, I, I would like to reassure uh, parents that you know we, we, it isn't you know this is it and nothing else is is considered. I mean, I have to say I'm following following Rasbo's hard sell there. Um, the, the support that Jazz had on coming out of the program was very good, and in fact, she's still still benefiting from that now. Yeah, that, Sorry, that, that's even that's even when an athlete, yeah, yeah. even when an athlete much. comes off the program, you know that serves that lifestyle service continues with the athlete to help them make that transition. Uh, and we had to go through those sort of thought processes uh, and steer him towards other opportunities uh, if we decided uh, that he wasn't for him. He seems to have come around or down the path, <laughs> but equally there were other opportunities uh, that, that were available. Yeah, we're, uh, we're, 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 we're definitely overshot, overshot slightly, and I'm sure there are people who've got other things to do. I mean, you know, there's nothing stopping parents staying back. You're welcome to stay here and have a further chat if there's things to, to, to chat about. Um, but yeah, just a, a big thank you again to David for putting his time, energy, and driving here to, 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 to offer his wisdom. Uh, this, as you hopefully will be aware, is hopefully being recorded if I've pressed the right buttons um, and, and there's the chance to listen to it again or to listen to the first one that Andy Hounslow, Richard's father um, and James's father um, 
uh, presented uh, a few months ago. Um, the next webinar presentation, I don't know if you're following these, um, but they are the webinar presentation, so that's not a formal um, you know, face-to-face -face type thing, but something that's done over the internet where you can listen to a, an expert in the field um, talk around an area that hopefully is of interest uh, to you and your, your, your offspring. And the next one um, is on the adolescent brain on the 24th of January. Um, if you are unsure how to find that, then if you go to the adolescent brain. <laughs> yeah, if you're unsure where to find that, then you better listen. Maybe I need to do that as well. Um, but yes, so you can find out, uh, a link to that off the British Canoe website. Thank you for attending. Um, and yes, thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers.